Hello, hello, gorgeous souls. Welcome to the September 2024 Starseed Astrology Forecast. I have the fabulous calendar that I put a lot of time and effort into here in front of us to go over with you. But for those of you new to my channel, hello and welcome. My name is Heather Hobson of the Starseed Sanctuary. I am the CEO. I'm the only employee, essentially. Um, and I specialize in Starseed Astrology, which is a beautiful blend of both tropical and sidereal systems, as well as an integration back to what astrology is all about, the stars. It's not just about the 12 zodiacs, constellations. It's about all of those other beautiful stars, galactic homes that we sometimes forget to integrate into our astrology. So I also specialize in integrating asteroid astrology, black holes, nebulas, and all kinds of other fabulous evolutionary astrology points for us to really expand what astrology is and what it can do. It's a powerful, powerful tool, and I'm thrilled to be bringing it here to you. All right. So we just wrapped up Mercury retrograde. As many of you know, it was a rough Mercury retrograde, I think, for a lot of us, um, but productive too, in some ways, perhaps. And so now that Mercury is moving direct, we're still in that shadow phase for another couple of weeks, but you can feel a little more confident now moving forward. If you were putting off starting a new big project, if you were putting off making a major purchase, if you were putting off some big initiation of something, now is a pretty good time to get moving on that, especially as we're approaching the new moon on the 2nd of September. Um, it's probably good to get some of those things started before eclipse season begins and potentially throws a little wonky wrench in the system. So we also have a Pluto retrograde moving back into the 29th Capricorn anoretic degree on the 1st. We have a lot actually going on just in the first couple of days of September. So Pluto, as you know, just transitioned into Aquarius in the tropical zodiac system. It's been kind of just kicking it at zero degrees Aquarius for quite some months, even though it has been retrograde since May. And now Pluto in its retrograde phase is moving back to the 29 degree of Capricorn. This is the last time that Pluto is going to be in Capricorn for the rest of our lives. And the 29th degree is called the anoretic degree because it does represent a point of crisis in our charts, in the transit chart as well. So you want to probably look at where does that house cusp fall for you between Capricorn and Aquarius? It's between, right? It's kind of like on the cusp of two different houses in your chart. That can give you some insight into what you need to revisit for the final time to close out this very potentially intense, but karmic rebirth, right? Capricorn, as we've seen during its transit through Pluto, has started in 2008 during the banking and housing crisis during the big crash, right, of 2008. And Capricorn rules things like banks, uh, positions of power, government, structure, organization, building, um, all of those kind of Saturnian ruled things. We've definitely experienced a flavor and a taste of Pluto and Aquarius with the AI boom, with the tech boom, with social media boom, with astrology boom as well, the Aquarius rules. But we're revisiting Capricorn, Pluto and Capricorn at that crisis degree one last time because there are some codes there that we really are called to unlock. And Capricorn can sometimes get a bad rap, I think, in the Zodiac as being kind of cold or stoic, uh, being a, all business, being all about kind of the work, right? The workaholic of the Zodiac. But in evolutionary astrology, we generally will look to the polar opposite for balance. Pluto rules intensity. It's intense it is long lasting and it's the deep, deep parts of our psyche. It is the shot. It's the depth of the underworld, right? And so in order to free ourselves from any karmic debt, from any final integration or shadow work that we need to do around this Pluto and Capricorn cycle, we can lean in to the opposite of Capricorn on the Zodiac, which is cancer. 
And so cancer is really inviting us to feel our feelings. There's a huge 16 year cycle that we are closing out um, as Pluto moves back to that 29 degree of Capricorn for the final time in our lifetimes. And it's going to be um, at that 29 degree until I believe it's November 19th, I want to say. Yeah, November 19th. Um, so Pluto does station direct on October 10th. So that's lovely in certain ways, but it's still going to be at that 29th crisis degree all the way up until November 19th. So take a little time to really integrate what has this last 16 year cycle been for you? What are you really wanting to finally make peace with? And if there's any remaining integration or shadow work that you need to do, now is the time to do it. Uh, you don't want to take anything that you don't want to take with you into this new brand new cycle that's really affecting the entire collective because Pluto is one of the furthest out planets in the system. Okay. Then also on the first, Uranus, the great awakener stations retrograde and we know retrogrades are not bad they're actually very powerful cycles that invite us to look a little more inward um so uranus is the higher octave of mercury the messenger of the gods which kind of rules like mundane day-to-day -day communication so uranus is kind of like this higher communication however it's retrograde so it's asking us to revisit our higher communication with the higher dimensions in a way. It's also, I think, inviting us to receive cosmic downloads. There can definitely be an element of needing or wanting to rebel with Uranus and a need for liberation and humanitarian pursuits, right? So that energy is focused very much more inward when a planet is retrograde. And, you know, Uranus transits are a little hard to predict in a lot of ways. Um, we're going to talk about a couple really big activations that are happening with Uranus um, a little later in, in this webinar. Um, so some other important things popping off on the first, the Ursa major alignment with the big bear that continues through a good chunk of September. And then we're going to be experiencing the super galactic center portal alignment. Very excited for that, as well as the opposite alignments of Pegasus, Phoenix, and Zeta Reticuli. So Pegasus is going to be visible in the night sky, the stars, the constellation of Pegasus. Great to go out in the, in the sky at night to go check that out if you're in the northern hemisphere. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you might want to look out for a Phoenix and the Reticulum constellation because those are also going to be visible in the night sky this month. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the new moon on the second. So this new moon is going to be conjunct Alioth in Ursa Major and Asteroid Gaia. So there's a very strong element of needing to get grounded, needing to connect with the Earth and really being thoughtful about what do we want to set for our intentions this month and um, to be thoughtful and meticulous, but not in a perfectionistic or debilitating way, which sometimes Virgo can be. And on that day as well with the new moon, we have Venus conjunct asteroid Merlin and the South Node. So on that same day as the new moon, there's like this activation of our inner magic, some magical gift that we had in a past life, which is the South Node, is coming to fruition in regards to our relationships or it, there's some activation of a magical past life gift that is coming up for you as a way where you can, I think, more deeply value yourself or maybe even make money off of it too. We also have on that same day, the North Node conjunct the Pac-Man Nebula. Um, and I talked extensively about the Pac-Man Nebula in my Astrology of Nebulae webinar. If you have not seen it, I highly recommend you check that out. I'll link it below. And then eclipse season begins. I mean, we're already technically in the pre-shadow phase of eclipse season as the 1st of September kicks off. 
So we know eclipse season, eclipse season kind of has, has like a Uranian energy to it. So eclipses, we can definitely, you know, put out the vibe that each eclipse is giving. However, they're somewhat hard to really say exactly how it's going to affect us, right? Because they're faded. They're incredibly faded. They're incredibly destined. Wild things can happen during eclipse season that are sometimes for our highest good, are always for our highest good, I will say, but sometimes are shocking. And so they require us to pivot. They require us to trust, have faith, but also kind of like loosen our grip and really just allow what needs to unfold to unfold really, really important. I think one of the most important things to remember with the eclipse season that we're going to be moving through, through the middle of October, really, is that eclipses, quite literally, <laughs> eclipse something. So there's something that is temporarily shadowed. A shadow is cast as the sun and the moon, right, eclipse each other. And so Sometimes during eclipse season, like something happens, it could be big, it could be small, it could be earth shattering, but we're not exactly sure like what it means or how to interpret it. There's something that's being hidden in a way, but usually almost always after the eclipse season is over, then we have clarity because right, it's not whatever that thing is, isn't being eclipsed anymore. So eclipse season really is, as I said, about trusting that process, knowing that you're going to get clarity later down the road, usually two or three weeks after the eclipse season wraps up. And eclipse season generally lasts like, you know, six to eight weeks, give or take, usually two weeks before the first eclipse and two to three weeks after the last eclipse. Um, and I will say that the lunar eclipse, it's a partial lunar eclipse, full harvest moon on the 17th of September is really a big culmination. If you think back to six months ago when you we had the new moon in Pisces, um, that would have been, what is that, in March? Yeah, in March, the new moon in Pisces. What was going on at your life during that time? Right before the first eclipse season of 2024. This lunar eclipse, full harvest moon on the 17th is a culmination of that. There's something that is now being illuminated. It's either a time of celebration of reaping the benefits of harvesting the rewards of the seeds you planted during that time, or it's a time to release and adjust. And it could be both. <laughs> it absolutely could be both. Um, and interestingly, this first lunar eclipse we have in our current fall eclipse season is conjunct Pegasus and Neptune. Okay. It's a big one. And most of the stars in Pegasus are considered prophetic stars. They hold a lot of codes for psychic gifts, for extrasensory um, abilities. And so there definitely is an illumination of that for many of us an activation of some of our deeper, deeper soul gifts. Um, I feel like that's a big theme actually for the whole month with multiple different planetary, um, luminary and asteroid transits, um, as well as the black hole, right? The super galactic center alignment. There's like this powerful portal of codes that are showering down on earth really really inviting us to deepen in to our psychic or extrasensory gifts or to activate them if they have not been if they've been laying dormant I feel like this month is going to really like open that wide for a lot of people um, also during the first lunar eclipse on the 17th of Pisces I'm on the 17th of September, conjunct Pegasus and Neptune, Atlantis is going to be opposite the moon. So asteroid Atlantis, the day before this first lunar eclipse, the sun is going to be conjunct Atlantis. This first lunar eclipse has a very Atlantean energy to it. Um, a culmination point of that time. I know a lot of us have past life, parallel life connections to Atlantis. 
and Lemuria as well. And so this is an illumination and activation of that. Um, a repairing, a solar grid repair is really what it feels like to me um, in the grid work sense. But it could definitely look different for you where that's showing up in your chart. Um, and so as a full moon is the sun in opposition to the moon, Atlantis is gonna be opposite the moon on the 17th. So there is this pole that's asking us to integrate um, any wounding, any past life trauma connected to Atlantis. Um, I've actually worked with a lot of clients recently that had Atlantean past parallel lives and have like a fear of drowning or a fear of swimming or a fear of the water. Like they might live near the ocean, but they're like super afraid to even get in. And so this is kind of like an invitation to look at that a little bit, to face your fears, to move through any core wounds around connections to Atlantis. And, you know, Atlantis fell because there was a misabuse of power. There was an abuse of power, a misuse of power, I should say. Um, so I think connecting to crystals as well is going to be really helpful for people to unlock and integrate psychic gifts, as well as to work, to work with Atlantean energy in a higher octave way, in a healing way, where you're not just healing yourself. You're also able to connect a little bit to earth energy through crystals you're working with. I always really recommend that people, um, after they've done some work with the crystal, to return it to the earth for a couple of days, if you can, in your backyard or for a couple of hours, if you're just out and about somewhere, um, because that also helps to heal the earth. You know, the work that you're doing has a huge ripple effect. And so we want to ground that, anchor that into the earth to help the planet itself as a conscious being, as well as the collective. Okay. And then the second eclipse that we have, I do have it on here. It happens in October. So October 2nd, it's an annular solar eclipse on that new moon in Libra in the sidereal system. It's conjunct Corvus, the crow, Another super powerful psychic medium, um, Corvus starseeds. I love Corvus starseeds. They really are very comfortable in the Bardo space. They're very comfortable with the liminal, with the void, with that place in between dimensions, in between worlds, right? They often have um, ancestors, uh, power animals, spirit guides that, that really like surround them. Um, sometimes ghosts as well or other attachments, but they're usually helping them to guide them. So that solar eclipse is conjunct Corvus the Crow. It's conjunct Black Moon Lilith. It's conjunct Maki Maki, which is one of the minor evolutionary planets, which is the higher octave of Uranus, Mercury, Uranus, Maki Maki. So this is like super extrasensory communication and abundance and luck. And Mercury is also conjunct there. Um, I couldn't even fit it on the <laughs> calendar because there wasn't room. But that solar eclipse on the second, the final eclipse of this eclipse season is also having a activation with the asteroid, the Sphinx. Um, so this second eclipse really carries this Egyptian energy with it, this ancient Egyptian code into it. Whereas the first eclipse, the one on the 17th, conjunct Pegasus, has more of an Atlantean energy to it. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of codes coming through. Um, and no, Egypt, ancient Egypt was, you know, what came after the fall of Atlantis. So they are closely connected, however, have very different and unique energies in their own ways. So that's a little highlight on the eclipses for this coming eclipse season. Um, and you can get a free astrology uh, eclipse workbook on my website. I'll link that below if you guys want to get that. It's a really helpful tool, tool um, for the 2024 eclipses, even though we're, you know, just the last the eclipse season. You can take a dive into that and see exactly how the eclipses are going to be hitting your natal chart, what they're activating for you, and some really good tips and tools for working with eclipse energy. Okay, 
Um, oh, and then I also wanted to point out um, some of the other starseed alignments and activations we have. Those are in blue for the opposite alignments when they're visible in the night sky, and they're in green when they are conjunct the sun. So we have Ursa Major, the big bear, getting activated at a few key dates throughout the month. We also have the sun in opposition to Phoenix, the firebird, from September 4th through the 7th. Um, this is a beautiful time during oppositions, during the opposite starseed alignments for healing, for healing, for integration, for shadow work. During the direct alignments with the sun, those are a little more of activation days where we get insights, downloads, activation of dormant soul gifts, um, connections or communications with star guides from those star systems as well. Um, and so the sun's going to be opposite Phoenix, the fourth through the seventh. And then the sun's going to be opposite Pegasus, the 13th through the 20th. The sun's also going to be opposite, so visible night sky, Zeta Reticuli on the 14th. Um, each one of those has its own unique flavor, of course. And if you're not that familiar with the various starseed families, you can also check out the starseed alignments workbook. All right. And then a couple other big things I wanted to point out. The big things are in red. <laughs> we talked about Pluto. We talked about eclipse season. Venus conjunct Arcturus on the 16th. That's the day before the first eclipse in eclipse season. Venus is the planet of love, of personal values, of beauty and aesthetic and relationships. And it's conjunct Arcturus. The Arcturians are master healers. So if you are an Arcturian starseed or you resonate with Arcturus energy, that's a beautiful day to work with Arcturian energy for healing in regards to matters of the heart, love, or even finances. Okay. And then another one I wanted to point out was on the 5th, September 5th, asteroid Apollonia is going to be conjunct Mercury. So Apollonia is a very beautiful star system that I have a great affinity for. Um, it was destroyed in one of the galactic wars. And so it does not exist in this dimension anymore, but it is still doing its thing. You know, it's, it's really a beautiful elemental world where there's lots of fairies. There's lots of elemental beings. It's kind of like a utopian place, um, really beautiful energy. And so as that asteroid is conjunct Mercury, the messenger of the gods, planet of communication, pay attention to any signs or symbols you get, especially from elemental energy, earth energy, potentially fairies or other galactic guides coming through for you on the fifth. Um, that could definitely be an Apollonian guide. All right. And then we have the equinox is coming up on the 22nd as Libra season begins in the tropical. Uh, Virgo season will begin in the sidereal on that day. And then Uranus is going to make another exact conjunction to Al Gol, Medusa's head, um, starting September 27th through the 9th of November. Yeah, that's right. That's a good long exact conjunction with it. So we talked extensively about Algol Medusa's head in previous uh, webinars and forecasts that I've done. And we've talked extensively about it on Patreon as well. So I'm not going to go into it in extreme detail here, but just to remind you that that is a very powerful activation that's going to be coming through. We have some really intense <laughs> transits, I will say, you guys, uh, with Uranus conjunct Algol, you know, all the way through early November. We have that Mercury Kazemi on the 30th. That's a big activation where Mercury is an exact conjunction with the sun highlighting our mind, our thoughts, our communication, and yes, the super galactic center alignment on the 23rd. And then the final thing I really wanted to highlight, which I think is going to explain for a lot of you why things have been so intense, because um, there's many, many astrological factors at play with this, but it's this mini grand trine that has really been happening uh, with the gods of change, which are the outer planets, the more generational planets. So that's Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. 
So this mini grand trine has been activated recently and it's Uranus in Taurus is trine Pluto in Capricorn as it just stationed back. And both Uranus and Pluto are sextiling Neptune, which is in Pisces. This is a big, big deal, you guys. Even though it's a mini grand trine, it's not an equilateral grand trine where they're all trining each other um, in the same element. This is going to be active all the way through 2029. And so I just want to read you a little bit about it, some of the research I've done on it, because it's very interesting. And I will add this to my blog too. So it's available for everybody um, to read um, in the next couple of days. <laughs> so the outer planets, right? They're called oftentimes the gods of change, if you will. Um, it's Uranus, it's Neptune, it's Pluto. And when they line up in certain ways, big, big changes, long lasting changes happen because they're outer planets, right? Um so one example of this is the Uranus-Pluto conjunction that happened throughout the 60s and the 70s. It was like big change now, the hippie love movement, right? Like free love, peace, the Vietnam War. That energy really revolutionized people and countries everywhere. And then we had another example of some of these big outer planet transits is the Uranus-Neptune conjunction that happened from the late 80s to the late 90s. Um, and that coincided with the collapse of the Soviet Union into the Cold War. Other structures around the world really changed. The internet took off, right? And a lot of people started exploring spiritual awakening. Uh, that's kind of the birth of like what we call now the new age move movement, even though it's not new, it's ancient, ancient information coming back. Um, so those are two planet combinations that I just gave examples of, but right now, all the way through 2029, we have all three outer planets involved. So that's big, big game changing energies, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto combined. Uh, fortunately it's harmonious, right? <laughs> so just keep that in mind. This is a harmonious aspect. And it is actually quite unusual. So there hasn't been an alignment uh, of those three outer planets since the 1770s, 250 years ago. And the outer planets had a grand trine, an equilateral triangle that coincided with the Declaration of Independence, the American Revolution. And we will not have another outer planet alignment with all three planets until 2190. Okay, so that's 170 years from now. So this really is a once in a lifetime outer planet gods of change, major activation that's happening all the way through 2029. So the next five years. If you weren't already aware <laughs> of all the massive changes going on, but this explains a lot. And I think this also helps us figure out how to work with it, right? And how this is actually activating different parts of our charts. So from now to 2029, these gods of change are going to work through your natal chart in some way. Pretty much any planet or sensitive point between zero and nine degrees of any sign or between 27 and 29 degrees of any sign is going to be activated powerfully by this mini grand trine of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And also right now, Uranus and Neptune are also activating 24 to 26 degrees of anything in your chart. Um, so look to see where are those placements for you? What planets are those? What houses, what area of your life are these big changes happening? And for most people, these are going to be super impactful astrology tran transits of their, the most in impactful potentially of their entire life because they're outer planets. They are indicative of long lasting transformation and change. Uranus, the great awakener, Neptune, the higher octave of Venus, it's unconditional love. Venus is conditional love. Neptune is unconditional, higher love, spiritual love. 
And Pluto, Lord of the Underworld, Hades, I know he sounds scary and gets a bad rap, but he wants to transform you through your personal underworld. He wants to help you. He's going to make things super intense so you pay attention and do the shadow work so you can liberate yourself from past parallel life karma, from the synthetic matrix itself, and live in alignment with the sovereign, divine, true source, true light matrix. Okay. So it's big stuff popping off. Um, there's obviously a million other things I could talk about in this calendar, but I think that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> so you guys let me know if you have any questions in the comments. I would love to hear from you. And you can book a reading with me if you want to really dive more deeply into like, wow, what is this gods of change evolutionary next five year transit activating for me? We can look at your natal chart, your solar return chart, your lunar return charts, and the transit charts. Um, my astrology readings are really not traditional astrology readings. They're much more deep, much more practical, and I think give real world tools for you to anchor in what you're here to do, to liberate yourself, to free yourself of past life binds, and to really right? Achieve your highest timeline. Astrology can do that for us. And so if you're interested in booking a live reading with me, um, I will link that below. You can check it out. If you've ever had a reading with me before, whether it was a written reading, a recorded reading, or a live reading, you can do the current or recurring, returning, <laughs> returning, returning astrology client. You get that discount. Um, get the free eclipse workbook so you can see what is popping off in this eclipse season to come. And if you want to learn more about how to become a master alchemist and get certified in only eight weeks, I have a fabulous new quantum alchemy course. I invite you to check out, please check it out. I will link it below. And that's all I have for you guys today. So thank you so much for watching. This. Um, I really appreciate it. If you have not already liked and subscribed to my channel, please do so now that helps me out a lot. And I'm just wishing you guys all a grounded, powerful, transformative eclipse season. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's really about just allowing ourselves to stay connected, regulate that nervous system, and allow life to unfold, right? It's this dance of fate and free will. We cannot control everything, and the eclipse season is a very good reminder of that. <laughs> all right, you guys. Thank you for joining me, and I will see you next month. Mm-hmm.